Hello and welcome to this lecture on decision making. Managers are paid to make decisions. Some decisions are tougher than others. Some are programmed and some are non-programmed decisions. Programmed decisions have a sort of mechanical if-then nature to them. The big bucks are paid for non-programmed decisions, which have no set way of being made, are unique or unusual, and infrequent. Effective decision-making can be the hallmark of a successful career and a successful life. What are we in the end but the sum of all of our decisions? So let's get started. The study and practice of management involves several overlapping or interrelated concepts. That's a good thing, because if you know a little about one thing, it makes it easier to connect the concept to another thing. If the study of management was a series of unrelated silos of knowledge, it would be very hard to connect them all together. Management is, by definition, connected to every part of business. Marketing, accounting, finance, computer systems, data analysis, etc. The subfields of management are also connected to each other. Let's talk about three very specific overlapping concepts. The first concept of concern is decision making. Most people make some bad decisions throughout their long course of their life. This is because we are human, and as such, we are prone to perceptual errors and to a seemingly ever-present set of emotions. If we could learn to better analyze how we perceive things, and if we could get emotions out of the process, we would almost always make better decisions. The second concept of concern is planning. Planning involves making decisions about the future. It is a series of steps designed to bring forth some desirable goal. Some of you may be planning to graduate from college. Some of you may want to plan a family soon. Some of you may want to plan how it is you will win the top sales prize at your company. In business, as in life, you have to have a plan. Any plan is better than no plan. It's okay to change your plan along the way, but you have to have some plan to succeed at whatever it is you're pursuing. Then you can measure your steps towards the achievement of your plan along the way and mark your progress. The third concept is of concern is strategy. Strategy involves a long-term plan to succeed in business and in life. First, you have to define what success is. For different businesses, it is for different people. Success can look very different. We use tactics to engage in and pursue our strategy. In business, strategies can be categorized. For example, there is a differentiation strategy that entails making products or services that are unlike most others in the market. Think Ferrari cars and Apple computers. Another strategy is retrenchment, which involves cutbacks in the number of products and or services being delivered so the company can focus its lean resources on fewer, more focused efforts. In life, such strategies also exist. The differentiation strategy is often effective in the dating world. If every potential romantic partner is the same, the choices between them would be easy. But we try to be just a little bit different from others that are on the market, so to speak, to make ourselves more appealing. Of course, being extremely, wildly off the charts different can be alienating to potential partners and limit our appeal. The retrenchment strategy can be effective when we decide that we have too many logs in the fire, so to speak. Sometimes we get spread so thin with all of our efforts and activities that we end up only doing them half-heartedly. Let's move on. It would be a perfect world if we could always make perfectly rational decisions. If we could do that, we'd try and abide by the rational choice decision process which is a paradigm that suggests that in decision-making, people should, and typically do, use logic and all available information to choose the alternative with the highest value. Of course, we're not all like Spock from Star Trek, but if we were, we'd follow these steps. Step one, the first step is the most time-consuming, according to Albert Einstein, pretty smart guy, and most important step, and it involves the determination of whether we have a problem or an opportunity. 
A problem is a difference between our current and desired situation. An opportunity is any deviation between current expectations and potentially better situations. The most optimistic of us would like to portray all problems as opportunities, but sometimes problems are just problems. Step two. Next, we have to choose a decision-making process. Should we make the decision ourselves? Let others give input? Let others vote? Or use tarot cards or a Ouija board? Then, step three, we have to develop a list of choices from which we will choose. This is not as easy as one might think, so it's very important here. Step four, then we make the choice. The best choice maximizes the subjective expected utility, that is, the probability of satisfaction. Be aware that sometimes the choice that satisfies us is not the same as the one that satisfies other stakeholders. Managers are hired to make non-programmed decisions, not decisions for which a policy is in place or an employee handbook can guide one's answer. Non-programmed decisions require all steps in the decision-making process model. Programmed decisions have been resolved in the past, so the best solution has been identified and documented. Step five, then we implement the choice and monitor it along the way. Step six, then we evaluate our decision in a sort of feedback loop. So here's an example that follows those steps. Suppose we are considering adopting uniforms for our sales staff at our retail store. The problem is that customers can't seem to figure out who an employee is and who a customer is. So they ask customers for help by mistake quite often. Sometimes customers just get so frustrated that they leave the store in a huff. The decision process should probably involve more than just the manager because it is the employees who will wear the uniforms, not the managers. We will want to involve employees at all levels, as well as perhaps even a few regular customers. Then we lay out the choices which are no uniform, matching polo style shirts, matching button up dress shirts, khaki pants, or dress blue pants, or any combination of these shirts and pants. After much debate and input, the best choice may turn out to be just the button-up style shirts and employees are free to wear whatever pants they want to wear. On a specific date, the uniform shirts become required and each employee gets three shirts at company expense. To evaluate the decision, customer satisfaction surveys are done periodically to compare the sales and the experiences of the customers before and after the uniform policy is implemented. After factoring in the cost of shirts for employees, management must determine if the sales increase is enough to offset the cost of the uniforms and if customer satisfaction markedly improves. If customer experience is improved but sales do not increase enough to offset the cost of the uniforms, then the company may consider making employees pay for their own shirts. Let's move on. Because things get in the way of purely rational decision making, we often take shortcuts. Sometimes to counteract the challenges that we face in decision making and sometimes just because we are constrained by things outside our control. These shortcuts are referred to as heuristics, which are simply rules of thumb or decision making shortcuts. The first heuristic is the anchoring and adjustment heuristic. With this heuristic, we are influenced by an initial anchor point and rarely move far from it. Have you ever been in a negotiation to buy something at a flea market or an auto dealer? The first thing they ask you is, how much do you have in mind for the price? They know that the first number heard tends to anchor the negotiations. You might reply, I don't know, how much are you asking? There is no ironclad rule on price negotiations or salary negotiations for that matter, but the final price or salary on which the two parties settle tends to not be too far from the first number uttered. 
It's called anchoring and adjustment because people tend not to adjust the decision or their price or their salary too far from the anchor, the first price given. The availability heuristic affects our decision making such that objects are assigned higher priority if it is easier to recall them. The important element here is recall. For example, emotions influence our recollection greatly. What are some of your strongest memories? It's a good bet that they are strongly tied to strong emotional experiences. Weddings, graduations, and sadly even funerals tend to stay in our memory because of the sheer joy and sometimes the total heartache of the experience. This can affect our decision making because a more perfect recall can help make decisions because if we've done it before, we remember it and we can do it again. Most of the time, those stinky old emotions get in the way and we fail to remember important details of experiences because they were not tied to our emotions. The representativeness heuristic suggests that the probability of an event is higher if it is similar to another event. We say, in essence, this seems a lot like what just happened a few weeks ago. It is so similar to that event that I will make the same decision that I made last time on the issue facing us this time. For example, think about rolling dice in a casino. Let's suppose that the object is to roll two sixes. Let's further suppose that you have rolled back to back sixes on your last two rolls. Should you bet that this next time will be just like the last time? Even though the odds of rolling two sixes three times in a row are astronomically dismal. Do hot streaks actually exist when the game has zero skill in it? It's not like shooting three-point shots in a basketball game. Sometimes your accuracy is good and some games it is not. Far too many gamblers believe in hot streaks. We see those people living under bridges around America. Well, it's time to discuss some issues related to shortcuts that sometimes just cannot be avoided. The first is satisficing, which is sacrificing the perfect solution because of the need to satisfy some decisions. Sometimes we have to choose the first solution that is good enough, like in hiring employees. Can we afford to wait three months to find the perfect person to work our cash register? Probably not. Sometimes we sacrifice the perfect solution because of the need to satisfy something more urgent. That is, we satisfice. Satisficing sometimes occurs under conditions known as bounded rationality, which is the process of limited and imperfect information that leads to suboptimal choice. That is, we have constraints or an inability to make the best rational decisions because of time and money shortages. These boundaries on rationality can be failed heuristics, the need to satisfy, emotions, or even simple constraints on time and resources. Sometimes time is the ultimate resource. In business, we cannot afford to sit around and wait for the perfect conditions so that we can make a perfect decision. If we do, our competitors will capitalize on our inaction and come to market with a new product or service that we are still just considering. Let's move on. So who gets to make decisions? Is it the manager or just the subordinates or both? Clearly the difficulty and impact of a decision plays a huge role in whether the decision is made by a group or not. Super big, important decisions are usually not best made alone. There are a multitude of factors to consider when figuring out who gets to make the decision. Here are some factors to consider. The decision quality requirement means that if the quality of a decision is important, then generally speaking, it should be made by a group. If on the other hand, decisions on which quality does not matter very much can usually be made by one person. For example, 
When picking what's on the menu on Tuesday in the company cafeteria, it is likely that only the cafeteria manager makes that decision. There is no need to send out a survey to all 500 employees to decide what's for lunch that day. Another issue is the sufficiency of the information held by the leader or the manager. On the one hand, if the leader is a world-class expert on something, they might be capable of making the decision alone. But if they know nothing about the issue, then they better consult with other people. All people cannot know all things, and as the old adage goes, two heads are sometimes better than one. On the other side of that coin is the issue of whether the subordinate has sufficient information to assist in the decision. If the subordinate knows nothing about the issue, and the issue will not affect them directly, then their input may not be needed. However, great leaders hire people who are smarter than they are in order to help them run great companies. So don't be afraid to ask a subordinate if they know something about the issue. Each of these factors is here in an acronym. QR is the quality requirement, LI, leader information, SI, subordinate information, GC, goal congruence, and ST, structure of the problem. That will be useful on the next slide. So let's move on. Suppose now that you have analyzed and weighed the factors on which the decision is a solo decision or a group decision. If you decide on just the manager making the decision without input from others, then you are making an autocratic decision. This is the pure solo decision making process, but there are two subtypes. There is A1, which is often a decision made in private without giving anyone any advanced heads up of the fact that there is even a decision to be made. With the A1 style, both the problem and the solution are a complete surprise to everyone except the person making the decision. With the A2 style, it's still autocratic, but the decision maker, usually a top manager, announced that a decision will be made soon on an issue in the workplace and that the manager will make the decision alone without input from anyone else. So an A1 decision is made without announcing the problem and an A2 decision is made after first announcing that there is a problem and that the decision will follow soon. Next, we turn to what are known as consultative decisions. These decisions are best made by consulting with other people. There are two forms of consultative decisions. The first is C1, which involves a manager informing the team that there is a problem and then meeting with people one at a time for individual consultations. But the manager makes the decision alone. They consult with others, but those others don't get a vote on the matter. They just help the manager with their opinions and some facts on the matter at hand. The other is, you guessed it, C2. The difference here is that instead of consulting with people one-on-one, -on -one, the manager consults with them all together in a room. The manager seeks suggestions from anyone present and then goes away and makes the decision alone but presumably based upon the suggestions of the team. The last type of group style is decision style is a true group decision. It is known as G2. I have no idea what happened to G1, but let's just stick with G2. In this scenario, everyone has a say so in the decision. The manager meets with the team as a whole and facilitates the arrival of a group decision on which everyone agrees. Bear in mind that sometimes consensus decisions are less than effective as teams have to make everyone happy with the decision when a consensus is required and the decision tends to get watered down a little bit. Let's move on. Okay, let's look at how it actually unfolds. 
Before your eyes glaze over, just bear with me as we walk through the issues in determining who gets input on a major decision regarding a requirement for employees to wear uniforms. Most people do not like wearing uniforms, but in some professions they are vital. Think about police, for example. Even physicians in a hospital have uniforms in a way. Did you know that the length of the white lab coat indicates rank, indicates rank in a hospital? So, regarding the requirement of wearing a uniform at work, the first node or issue with regarding the requirement is the QR node. The quality requirement. How important is the technical quality of the decision? Let's just say for the sake of argument that the technical quality of uniforms is high. This might be because requiring uniforms might induce some employee turnover and requiring the wrong uniform might cause a mass resignation. Next, we're at the CR or commitment requirement node and the issue of how important it is employee commitment to the decision. In this case, let's say it's highly important because everyone must wear a uniform if the policy is implemented. And if someone shows up to work without a uniform, then you have to involve the human resource department and go through a whole giant mess. At the LI or leader information node, we ask the question, does the leader have sufficient information to make a high quality decision? In this case, it's probably no, because let's say that this manager has never been required to wear a uniform and is just not familiar with them at all. Now we're at the ST or problem structure node and we ask, is this problem well structured? I'd say yes, because it's either a yes or a no question. And we know what happens when we say no, we lose customers and sales because customers cannot figure out who is an employee and who is not. So now we're at the CP, Commitment Probability Node, and we ask the question, if the leader makes the decision alone, will subordinates be committed to the decision? In this case, the answer is no. They will hate the uniforms no matter how flattering they are, mainly because they were not allowed to give input on them. Now we're at the GC, or Goal Congruence Node, and we face the question, do employees share the organizational goals to be attained in solving this problem? Let's say yes here, because when customers leave empty handed, the employees commission based paychecks suffer. They have a financial interest in it. Now we are at the CO node. Is conflict among employees over preferred solutions likely? I'd say yes, because if one group wants uniforms and the other does not, then there will be division amongst employees. They could divide into rival street gangs and call themselves the uniform lovers and the regular clothes wearers. Violence could break out at company picnics and long-term friendships will be split. Okay, I digress, but you get the point. If we said no at the CO node, then we would arrive at the SI node, subordinate information. Do employees have enough information to make a high quality decision? An answer of yes would have also arrived at the same decision style input, but there is a possibility of a no on the SI node, which leads to a different decision style. So in this case, the recommended decision making method is G2. That is the manager assembles all of the employees together and they hash out a, unif a uniform policy together on which everyone must agree. So we have averted gang warfare in the workplace, even though it might still break out and they would blame it on the manager. Let's move on. Strategy is the essence of very serious planning and decision making about the whole company. It is, in many ways, the ultimate form of planning, and it's almost never done alone, and it never affects only one or two people. It affects the whole company. So corporate strategy develops plans covering which businesses to be involved in, 
what markets to pursue, and where to operate. These are big picture things. If the corporation is only involved in one industry, then it must decide what market segment it will pursue and what locations will be involved. If the corporation is involved in many businesses, then it must decide which ones to focus its efforts on as well. And there are several types of corporate strategies, and here are four of them. A concentration strategy focuses on one or two sources of competitive advantage. For example, Microsoft focuses on PC computing software for the workplace. And this is evidenced by the amount of dollars invested in those products by Microsoft. Yes, they do and make other things, but Microsoft Office and Windows are two product lines upon which they concentrate their efforts. A vertical strategy involves operation and ownership of every step in the supply chain from bottom to top. For example, a small local restaurant might purchase and operate a local silverware and tableware company. They might buy land to grow their own vegetables and farm their own animals. They might house a small slaughterhouse on the farm to get fresh meat to the restaurant, etc., etc. A vertical strategy gives the ultimate control to the various inputs on the goods or services. With a vertical strategy, a company owns the business every step of the way. Now, there are two forms of diversification strategies. The first is related diversification, which involves various businesses that are somewhat related. If someone owns a barber shop or a beauty salon, they might develop a series of products for sale in the salons or even in other retailers. They might develop and sell all sorts of brushes and blow dryers too. These products are related to barber and beauty stuff, but they are in different markets. Cutting hair and doing makeovers is very different from the chemistry involved in developing hair products, which is also very different from developing or compiling electronic parts into usable hair tools. The other type of diversification strategy is one of unrelatedness. With this strategy, companies invest in somewhat dissimilar interest industries. Sometimes this strategy is so that they can offset the risk of loss in one industry with the possibility of wins in another. Sometimes it's just because a market opportunity exists. For example, there once was a man named Billy Bob who owned a backhoe repair shop. His team got really good at fixing backhoes and sometimes the customers would just hang around the shop for a few hours while their backhoe was being fixed. He decided to open a barbecue sandwich shop right next door. And now he is the impresario of Billy Bob's backhoe repair and barbecue sandwich shops that we see in every small town in Texas. Okay, I'm making that up. But there probably isn't such a business anywhere that does these two very unrelated businesses. But if there were, this would be an example of unrelated diversification. Business strategy encompasses the decisions made for individual businesses. For a company like Disney, there are likely different business strategies for ESPN and for Disneyland. For Billy Bob's Backhoe Repair and Barbecue Shop, he could have two different business strategies, one for backhoe repair and one for barbecue sandwiches. Now, business strategies come in two main forms. Either the strategy is a low-cost strategy or it's the differentiation strategy. The low-cost strategy seeks to minimize its cost at every point in the supply chain, from raw materials to manufacturing to wholesale distribution to retail sales, a company does not need to be vertically integrated to seek lower costs at these stages. It needs to minimize costs from suppliers at those stages. For example, Walmart uses the low cost strategy. They minimize costs all along their supply chain. You will never see a Walmart, Walmart store down a winding desolate road in the middle of nowhere. They are always very close to major highways, so delivery trucks can access them much easier and therefore much cheaper. Now, Billy Bob, on the other hand, might use a differentiation strategy with his barbecue sandwiches. 
His sandwiches might be made with vinegar-based sauce like in the Carolinas, but he sells them in Texas, so his product is different from his competitors. Another example of a differentiation strategy is that which is used by Ferrari or um, Lamborghini. Their products are very different, instantly recognizable, and very expensive. The functional strategy is based upon the functions of a business, like accounting, marketing, operations, manufacturing, etc. These various functions must have strategies that are compatible. For example, if the manufacturing section of a business wants to use the most expensive processes and parts so they can minimize quality control errors, but marketing wants the products to be very affordable, there is some major incompatibility there. A company can't manufacture things with expensive components and then sell them for cheap prices. So good managers help align functional strategies. According to Harvard professor Michael Porter, five industry forces determine an industry's overall attractiveness and potential for long-term profitability. The stronger these forces are, the less attractive the industry becomes to corporate investors because it is more difficult for companies to be profitable in those industries. Let's look at all five forces individually. Character of the rivalry is a measure of the intensity of competitive behavior between companies in an industry. Is the competition among firms aggressive and cutthroat? Or do competitors focus more on serving customers than attacking each other? Or is this somewhere in between? Both industry attractiveness and profitability decrease when rivalry is cutthroat. Does anyone really want to start a business in an industry that is aggressively cutthroat? Heck no. It's hard to make any money in that sort of an industry. The threat of new entrants is a measure of the degree to which barriers to entry make it easy or difficult for new companies to get started in an industry. If it is easy for new companies to get started in the industry, then competition will increase and prices and profits will fall. Let's contrast a lawn mowing business with a nuclear power company. The threat of new entrants is an everyday thing for lawn mowing. Any teenage kid can borrow a mower and make some money. If they're good at it, they might get some repeat customers, but someone may come in and undercut their price at any moment. In the nuclear power industry, the threat of new entrants into that industry is super low. How many nuclear power companies are there? Probably only a handful. This is very different than lawn mowing. The bargaining power of buyers is a measure of the influence that customers have on the firm's prices. If a company is dependent on just a few high volume buyers, these buyers will typically have enough bargaining power to dictate prices. By contrast, if a company sells a popular product or services to multiple buyers, then the company has more power to set prices. Let's contrast defense contractors with the cell phone business. Defense contractors usually only have one or a few customers, which include the U.S. military and our close allies. That's it. The cell phone business has millions of customers, so those customers can drive prices down a lot. The threat of substitute products or services is a measure of the ease with which customers can find substitutes for an industry's products or services. If customers can easily find substitute products or services, the competition will be greater and profits will be lower. If there are a few or no substitutes, competition will, by definition, be weaker and profits will be higher. Now let's compare the defense contract industry with lawn mowing. As mentioned, anybody can mow a yard, and substituted lawnmower persons are cheap and everywhere. Defense contractors only have a few substitutes. In the Western world, those substitutes come from NATO nations and a few other countries, but that's it.
The bargaining power of suppliers is a measure of the influence that suppliers of parts, materials, and services to firms in an industry have on the prices of those inputs. If an industry has numerous suppliers from whom to buy parts, materials, and services, companies will be able to bargain with suppliers to keep prices low. This force is really about business to business or B2B issues. Some firms rely on suppliers to make their products or even their services if that's their industry. Let's compare personal computers to restaurants. Personal computers are dependent upon the supply of their central processing units or CPUs that come mostly from Intel or AMD. Now, Apple uses their own processors, but they do not license them to anyone else. So they are not dependent upon suppliers of CPUs. Other PC manufacturers like Dell, HP, or Lenovo must use either Intel or AMD. Those suppliers have a stranglehold on the PC companies. Restaurants, on the other, other hand, typically get their raw material foods from a multitude of ent entities. They sometimes depend upon the giant conglomerate Cisco, but if Cisco raises their prices or if Cisco doesn't have a certain ingredient, some restaurants will go straight to local farmers or even grow their own food. In the restaurant industry, the bargaining power of suppliers is much more limited than in the CPU industry. Let's move on. Well, thanks. That's all for now.